So, um, last time we talked about the Shapley Shubik, right? I actually had one more thing, maybe five minutes more to say about the Shapley Shubik, and then we'll talk about the other. I said there were two different methods for judging power in weighted, weighted voting systems. We're going to talk about the other one today. Um, and then that'll do it. I, maybe, I don't know if we'll finish it all today, but after that we're going to move on to something actually totally completely different, not about this uh, weighted voting anymore. Uh, anyway, a few um, more things to say about, a bit more about the shapley Shubik. Um, I want to talk specifically about shapley Shubik and um, dummies and dictators. Dummies and dictators. I will just refresh our memory. How you do the shapley Shubik, that's, you had something like, this was an example that we did at the end last time with four alternatives. And we, um, an example with four alternatives takes you a long time to do the whole thing because you have to write down, remember, all possible permutations of the voters. That is all the different ways you could rearrange them, and I'm not going to do them all. But you write down all the perms. Boom. I changed to red by accident. Um, let's say I'll just do a few of them. How about A, D, B, C, or maybe D, C, B, A. And then in each one, in each row, so if you're doing the full problem, you would have had a lot of rows here, 24 rows in this example. You write down what are the weights of those people in order. They would be 5, 3, 4, 3, and this one will be 3, 3, 4, 5. And then each time you decide who is the pivotal voter. I'm just trying to refresh our memory here. And I hope you remember, pivotal means as you go sort of left to right across the list here, at, and you're adding them up, as you go and add them up, um, there will be some point at which you meet or exceed the quota. And that's what I'm looking for. So the five is not meeting the quota. Five and three is eight, which still is not because the quota in this case is nine. 5 and 3 and 4 is meeting the quota, so the 4 is pivotal, that's B. And how about this one? Actually, this one's also B. I just made these up. I didn't intend for it to be the same both times, but uh, this is how we do the shapley Shubik. And then you count them all up after you make the full chart, which I'm not going to do, and you look at the proportion of how many times each voter is pivotal. All right, I want to talk about... Um, what happens when you're doing this if one of your voters is actually a dictator or if one of your voters is actually a dummy? What if, what if let's say, A was a dictator? That means that A has enough votes by themselves to meet the quota, and everybody else, they don't have enough votes to meet the quota even if they all voted together, right? A has all the power and the others do not have all the power. Can anybody say something about the pivotal, you know, you go down the list and you choose the pivotal each time. If A is a dictator, what's gonna happen? Yes, that's right, everybody else will be a dummy. I mean, in terms of the pivotal, when you choose the pivotal uh, voter, yeah? Yeah, it'll always be A, right? The other ones, they can't possibly make up to the quota by themselves. And the A, being a dictator, will always make the quota by themselves. So that means, like, as you go down the list and you're adding the numbers up, the numbers from all those dummies will never add up to anything useful. But as soon as you hit the, the, uh, the dictator, you hit the quota. So what if A was a dictator? I will say then they are always pivotal, like in every row. The dictator, if there is a dictator, they will always be pivotal in every row. And so the conclusion here then is the shapley Shubik of a dictator. The proportion of times that they are the pivotal, it's like all the time, every time they are pivotal. That as a percentage would be 100%, or if you write it as a fraction, it's like whatever, the numerator of the fraction will be the same as the denominator, right? Uh, the shapley Shubik of a dictator is one, right? If as a fraction, you would simplify the fraction and get one, i.e., what I mean is 100% if you wrote it as a uh, percentage, right? This is the maximum that the shapley shubik could ever be because it, it's a proportion. So the biggest it could be would be one 
one out of one, right? And for the same reasons, the shackley shubik of a dummy will be a zero, right? A dummy can never be the pivotal voter because the whole point of a dummy is that they, their vote never um, influences the outcome. So their vote can never be the one that actually tips it over the quota. So I'm going to say the shapley shubik of a dummy is zero, right? Zero percent. Or as a fraction, it's always going to be zero over whatever, whatever the denominator is. All right? And there was one other type of sort of simple judgment of power that we've talked about, and that is um, veto power. What can you say if one of my voters has veto power? So this is actually a little bit more complicated to think about. We're not going to get really into it. But what if, let's say, voter A has veto power? This does not mean that they are always pivotal. Veto power means that A's vote is necessary in order to make it to the quota. But A's vote might not be enough by itself to make it to the quota. So for instance, if A comes first in the list, they may not, um, they may not be pivotal, even though their vote is necessary. Um, one thing you can say, if A has veto power, then, uh, then A is pivotal. whenever it is listed last. That's because if you have a veto person who's last in the permutation, then everybody else, as they vote, they can't make it to the quota without this veto person, A, right? Which means if A is listed last, they will automatically be the one who finally make it, makes it to the quota. So um, a veto power candidate is pivotal whenever it is listed last, and I will just say, and also maybe some other times. So this is not, I'm not saying they're only pivotal when they're listed last, but I will also maybe some other times. You actually can't say exactly what the shapley Shubik of a veto power person is, but they are pivotal at least every time that they're listed last. And how often are they listed last? Well, like if there's three candidates, an individual one will be at the end one out of three times, right? Or if there are four of them, an individual one will be on the end one out of four times. So what you can say is um, for a, uh, let's say, N voter system, A voter with uh, veto power has the shapley shubik greater than or equal to 1 over n. That's the amount of times that they appear last in the lists. And it's guaranteed if they are last, they are definitely going to be pivotal on those times. They might be pivotal more than that. That's why there's this, oops, there's this greater or equal to here. Not necessarily straight up equal. All right. This is what I want. I said I was going to do five more minutes. That was more like seven or eight. Sorry. Any thoughts about this? This is the end of the Shapley Shubik. Uh, this is all I want to say about the Shapley Shubik. Excellent. Let's talk about the other one. The other one is also named after a person, and it has, uh, in my opinion, kind of a uh, interesting sounding name. This is called the what? Bonshoff power index. And it is another way of measuring power in a weighted voting system. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about like the, the history. I think it's an interesting story that led to the development of the Bonshoff power index. So Bonshoff was um, a, uh, a lawyer in Long Island. He wasn't a mathematician, actually. A lawyer um, in, uh, in Nassau County. Any, any Nassau County fans out there? Yeah. I don't know anything about Nassau County. Actually, I do know very specific details about the voting in Nassau County in the 1960s. Do you know about that? No, all right, you're about to. Um, Bonshoff was living in Nassau County, and he realized that the voting system that was being used was, was rigged. 
um, because it was a weighted voting system that was kind of dysfunctional. And in order to prove uh, that, that um, his voting system was dysfunctional, he created the Bonsoff Power Index. And he ended up suing the state of New York because he believed that the system in use at the time was unfair. But anyway, here I will describe to you the scene um, in the uh, 1960s. I don't know if Mr. Bonsoff is still living. Uh, anyway, um, there were six districts of voting. Maybe you can tell us where you're, which one you're in. So there was Hempstead. I, I am not aware of anything about these places. There were actually, Hempstead was so big it was divided into two separate districts. But anyway, there was Hempstead number one and Hempstead number two. And each, the way it works is there's these six districts and um, when they vote on stuff, like there were six people who were elected to represent those districts. And when they vote on stuff, they voted with, according to weights, based on the populations of the, the six different districts. So um, Hempstead, was so big they divided it into two, and each of the two Hempstead districts got 31 votes, all right? In practice, that means there was like one person who was the representative from Hempstead number one, and every time they voted, they got 31 votes. Uh, then there was, you ready for this one? North Hempstead, totally different, apparently. Um, these, the North Hempstead got 28 votes, there was also Oyster Bay, got 21. You heard of these places? Yeah, yeah all right, not me. Um, there's also Glen Cove, got two. And Long Beach, got two, all right? These numbers are according to populations. So from that, from that point of view, it makes sense to have different numbers based on different populations. You wouldn't want to give the Hempstead people the same votes as the, the uh, Glen Cove people, because there's hardly any people in Glen Cove, but much more people in uh, Hempstead. All right. Bonshoff, looking at this scenario, I think, um, oh, and I'll tell you, in order to pass the vote, um, you need 58 votes needed to pass anything. That's just a, a majority of, if you add all those numbers up together, it's something like uh, 100 and, I don't know, 116, I think. This, this is half of the total number of votes, 115, I think. Um, anyway, you need 58 votes needed to pass um, anything. All right, now when you look at the numbers, this, this represents a weighted voting system, right? So this is, if I were to write it in the way that we usually write weighted voting systems, a 58 is the quota, and then we got 31, 31, 28, 21, two, and two, all right? Now, you don't have to be a super genius to look at this and realize those twos are dummies. They have no power at all in this system, all right? So the residents of Glen Cove and Long Beach, now you can say, well, they should have less power because there are less of them, and that's true, but they shouldn't have zero power, right? Which is actually what they have in this system. They have no power at all. And in fact, this is less obvious, but I hope it won't surprise you if I say, if you look carefully at these numbers, actually the two, the two, and the 21 are all dummies. It turns out the 21 is, is a dummy in this also. Just because of the way those numbers can add up, the 21 can never make any difference, all right? Now that's a little more troubling, I think. There's actually kind of a lot of people in Oyster Bay in this system, and they have no power at all. So Bonsoff, you know, you can do a little percentages here. It turns out that um, in this system, 22% of the population is living in these dummy districts. So that means that 22%, that would be all the people in Oyster Bay, Glen Cove, and Long Beach. So 22% of the population have zero power. And uh, Bonsoff, I think, was living in one of those dummy districts, um, said, some may write, right? And um, 
Bonsoff ended up suing the state of New York and said that this is not fair because we have uh, people who are not, um, not being represented in our, you know, like the whole point of this is like we're supposed to have representative democracy, right? And this, it, like, this gives you the appearance that you have representation for all these people, but they actually don't have representation because their votes never matter for anything. Um, Bonsoff sued, sued the state of New York. This was in the 60s. This went on for, for a long time. They argued about it. Um, Bonsoff published uh, a, an influential paper in some kind of law journal called something like weighted voting is undemocratic or something. He wanted to like abolish, make weighted voting illegal because of scenarios like this. And actually, he ended up basically winning. So um, in uh, 1993, the state of New York outlawed weighted voting done in this way. I mean, you and your friends can do it, I'm sure, across state lines in New York, but um, weighted voting is no longer used in, uh, in governments in the state of New York because of Bonsoff's uh, making a big deal about it. All right. Anyway, uh, in order to convince people of what he was talking about, you can see like this is kind of a hard sell just because if you were to try to convince all your friends that like this system right here is totally unfair, your friends have to look pretty carefully at the numbers to agree with you, right? It's not obviously unfair, although maybe it is obvious that these two, two twos are unfair, but the, even the 21, that's not entirely obvious. And so Bonsoff in order to convince the judges and the government, he actually created the Bonsoff uh, Power Index. Um, anyway, I'll tell you how, how he did it. He came up with this on his own, although other, uh, this more or less same idea was, uh, had also been developed by other people. This is a common thing in, in math and science also. Other people came up with that idea also. Anyway, here's how you do it. Um, it's, I guess, vaguely similar to the shapley schubach in, in the sense that we're going to consider all possible ways that the people could vote and then count up how many times somebody was important. But it's done in a different way. So I would say something like, it's like the shapley schubach but not considered in order. I think what's a little strange about the shapley schubach is you imagine that the voters are voting in some particular order, which is not realistic. Like in, in the actual election, they don't vote in any particular order. The shapley schubach gets around this by saying, yeah, it's not realistic to cons focus on a particular order, but I'm considering all possible orderings. And so no single order is given any more uh, relevance than any other. And the shapley schubach works fine for that reason. But anyway, this has nothing to do with orders. Here's an example. This is just a simple example here. 16, 12, 10, and 5. So we are going to consider not orderings of the voters, but just all possible ways that the voters could vote together. So I'm going to consider all possible ways. I'm going to call them ABC as usual. all possible combinations of voters which can meet the quota. And I'm going to make another big chart. So this like va will vaguely look like the shapley schubach although the chart is not as big as the shapley schubach um, All possible combinations of voters which can meet the quota. Here's what I mean by that. Um, one combination, you just want to, I want to think about every possible way that those three votes could combine to add up to 16. One way is if they all vote yes. So I'm going to call that one ABC. That's, that's one way. If they are all voting yes, then the total weight that they will get is add them up, 12 plus 10 plus 5, that's 27, right? Is there any other way that we could meet the quota? Do you really need all three of them? Actually, you don't need all three of them. You could just uh, take A and B. Those would still add up to 22, which meets the quota, right? The quota is 16, remember. Uh, you could also just take B and C together. That adds up to 15. Actually, that's not good enough, so I'm going to sort of cross that one out. 
I'm trying, I'm looking for only the combinations which actually can add together to meet the quota. Um, A and C is another possibility. That adds up to 17, which does meet the quota. All right. I'm considering all possible combinations which can actually meet the quota. Actually, I've already written them all down, although for the sake of completeness, we could also consider what if it was just A? Just A was, sorry, I scrolled 12, uh, 12 which is not good enough. Just B was 10, which is not good enough. Just C was 5, which is not good enough. All right. And there's just for technical reasons, sometimes people like to write. There is a combination in which nobody voted. That adds up to zero, which, of course, is not good enough. All right. So we, uh, what I did is I wrote down all possible combinations and then decided which ones actually meet the quota and which ones do not. And there are, in this example, three of them which meet the quota, all right? Um, in each of those, we're going to decide who is the important voters. Now, in the shapley shubik it's called Pivotal. It has a different name in Bonshoff because it, it, it's slightly different the way you think about it. But in each combination, we want to identify the, it's called the critical this time. The critical voters. In the Bonshoff, you could get more than one critical voter in each of the combinations. It's possible. In each combination, we want to identify the critical voters. These are the ones, the ones whose um, votes were necessary to meet the quota. Like you really needed them. If you had removed them, would the, would the quota still have been met? All right, so for example, in this example, I will just write this again so I don't have to scroll back to it. 16, 12, 10, and five. How about this? In this combination, A, B, C, who is critical? Remember the total in that case, the total Add it up to 27, right? If I add up the weights for A, B, and C, it all adds up to 27. Who is critical? You have to uh, look at this and decide for yourself which of those was really needed in order to get to the quota, which is 16. What do you say? A, B. A and B, yeah. In this combination, the C is not really necessary, right? Because if you had left the C out, then uh, you'd lose out on five votes. It'd still be 22, which still meets the quota. But if you leave the A out, then it goes down to 15, which is below the quota. And if you leave the B out, uh, then it goes to 17. Actually, that's still above the quota. Is that different from what I've said before? The answer is A. I think B here is not critical. Because if you were to remove B, you still meet the quota. So what I mean by this, I say A is critical. This is because, I'll just try to write in words what I just said. If we removed A, quota is no longer met. All right? But for B and C, that's not true. So I'll say B and C are not critical because you can remove them from that particular combination and the quota will still be met. We can remove them and still meet the quota. This is what critical means. All right, and the Bonshoff is about counting up how many times each of the voters can be critical. So it's similar to the shapley shubik is counting up the pivotal votes. Bonshoff is counting up the critical votes. Let's just try one uh, uh, other examples here. How about in this combination, A, B, which added up to 22? Remember the quota is 16 here. Who is critical? You should think separately for A. Is A critical or not? The question is, if I remove A, am I still be, uh, meeting the quota? And then separately, is B critical or not? What do you say? Uh, both A and B. Yeah, both of them are critical in this case. The A and the B are both critical. So A and B, both. Because they add up to 22, but if I had removed either one of them, 
the total would dip below the quota, which was 16. All right, and then uh, similarly in A and C, which added up to 17, again, both of them are critical in this case. This is what you got to look for critical when you're doing the bansa. Who is critical and who ain't? All right? I got a handout. Can you believe it? We only got 10 minutes. I'm going to do this thing so as to not disease you. This is actually a real world uh, weighted voting. This is not Bonds Hop's, uh, you know, Long Island system. This is about um, the Electoral College, I thought would be interesting to look at. Electoral College, of course, is a weighted voting system that we use to elect the president. Some people like it, some people don't like it. I'm not here to argue about it. What I have here are the electoral college results for the, um, the most recent presidential election, Trump versus Biden. And then also, um, just for fun, the Bush Gore Nader. You don't see Nader because he didn't get any electoral votes. Um, let's look first at the, um, the 2020 election, Trump versus Biden. Uh, the Electoral College, remember, is like a weighted voting system where you have to win particular states, and if you win that state, you get those points, and it has to add up to the um, total uh, number needed to win in the Electoral College is 270. So um, we're basically looking at, we have a big weighted voting system that looks something like the quota is 270, right? And then the states have their different weights. And in the case of the uh, Electoral College, the biggest weight is 55, which is California. And then the next biggest weight is 36, which is Texas TX. The next biggest weight is 29. And then there's another 29. This is Florida and New York, et cetera. You know, and the lowest weights are three. This is like Delaware, I believe also. There are some other states which also have three. All right. Um, If we look at, so look at the handout here. Let's look at the Trump and Biden side. Now, Biden was the winner, and so that's the combination of states which it took for Biden to win this election. So Biden's states add to 306, right? Which is, um, which is enough to meet the quota. The quota is 270. I would like us, can we look at the list here and say, um, which of those states were critical? If any, maybe none of them were, but are there any states where if you had removed them from Biden's total, then he would no longer be meeting the quota? That's what I want to think about. Take a look at the numbers. You got to get to 270, right? So ask yourself, uh, if I were to remove any of these states, is there any states where you take that state away and Biden would have would have ended up losing. What do you say? Like California. California is critical, right? That's because, so California is critical. That's because if you take California away from Biden, his total goes down by 55, which is no longer enough to win, all right? California is critical. And what I mean by that is, if we take California away, Biden won't get to 270, right? He'll, he, it would be less than 270, whatever. You do the math on that. Um, any others? I think the answer is no, there are no others. If you look at the next biggest state that Biden has in his column would be New York of 29, but if you subtract New York from 306, it's still above 270, right? And so California is critical, none other are critical. All right. Um, actually, if you look at the, I didn't print this out, but if you look at a similar, similar chart from 2016, the Trump versus Clinton, uh, I just looked these numbers up before class. Trump won 
304 electoral votes in that case. And um, Texas was the only critical state uh, in that election for Trump. If Trump had lost Texas, then that would have dipped him below uh, the, the threshold to win. But any other state, he could have lost any of the other states, all right? So this is um, Biden's, yeah, for Biden, California is critical. None of the other ones are. That means Biden could have afforded to lose any of the other states. He could not have afforded to lose California, right? Let's look at the other side. This was the Bush-Gore election, which is interesting just because it was much closer. Um, Nader is not listed because Nader did not win any electoral votes. But check out the totals. You see Bush's total is 271, only one vote higher than the quota. So in, um, this was 2000. Bush was the winner, right? Bush wins with 271 electoral college votes. Uh, are there any critical states for Bush in this case? The answer is yes, there are. Actually, all of them are critical. Bush needed every one of those states. If any of them had gone the other way, he would have lost the election, all right? So Bush wins with 271 votes. And in this case, all Bush's states were critical. This is actually very rare, like in a, in a real election in American politics. Usually, the electoral college numbers, when you look at them, it looks like a blowout. This one, Bush-Gore, was very close by the electoral college numbers. If you look on the other side, you know, Biden 306, Trump 232, it looks like, yeah, it wasn't even close. That's just because of the way the numbers work out. It, it, it actually, it was close, as we all know. And when Trump won, he won 304 to 230, whatever. 234, uh, I guess, is what it would have been. Is that right? No. 304 to 236? So I'm, I'm adding the numbers up wrong. Trump, yeah, Trump, when he won the first time, he got uh, 304. And he said immediately after, he said it was an absolute blowout. He said this was the biggest electoral college victory ever, which is just straight up false. It does look like a blowout, though, when you look at um, if you were to say, express these as percentages, it looks like Biden has a huge percentage of the electoral votes, which I suppose he does technically, but that, that doesn't actually represent any, anything like a meaningful blowout. All right. Anyway, that, that's the, the, the uh, handout. Any thoughts about that? Usually in a presidential election in America, there are not many critical states because um, it's usually not very close when you look at the electoral numbers. It's close sort of for other reasons. All right, um, can we just, we got four minutes. I think that's enough. Did you have a question? You're stretching, all right. Um, that's enough to just finish the specific example. If you look back at this one here. So in four minutes, we can finish computing the Bonshoff for this. I'm gonna copy this. What you do is you look at the combinations which actually do add up to the quota and each time we decide who is critical. And I'm gonna do this by making a little sort of chart of little maybe check marks. And we already said in the, in, in the first, uh, first combination A, B, C, the A was critical and nobody else was, right? So I'm gonna put a little X there. That means in that row, A was critical. In the second row, A and B, they were both critical. We talked about this a few minutes ago. The next row we ignore because they didn't even make, make it to the quota. And then the, uh, the, the, uh, the next row, A and C, they were both critical. A and C, all right? And now we've basically finished the work. You just count everything up and make a fraction, just like in the shapley schubik So now we count how many times they are critical. Number of times critical divided by the total number of criticals. You don't use the number of rows as the denominator because that actually is not big enough here. Um, you divide by the total number of like X's that you see up here, which in this example is six. And so when I do the Bonshoff, sorry, I gotta scroll and try and keep it all on the screen at once. 
So my final answer for this example, for the Bonshoff, A, I see three times is critical out of a total of, did I say six? I meant five. There are, there are five total check marks here, sorry. A is three out of five, which as a percentage, whoa, as a percentage, that's 60%. B is one time critical out of five, which is 20%, and C is also one out of five, 20%. That's how we do the bond soft. Those better add up to 100% or else you messed it up. All right, I think that'll do. We'll do some more examples of this next time. Have a good weekend.